this is the time where we actually rise up again and we say no longer are we gonna allow the next generation to fall into those patterns and get um, abused by that strategy that the enemy is deploying on this next generation and in our families. But it's time for the church to stand up and say, no longer, we're gonna take back ground that maybe we have lost the last couple of years. And we have a student ministry that is excited and expectant for what God can do again in their classrooms and their families. And they are not accepting of the patterns that the enemy is placing in their everyday life. So we are going into this next school year truly believing God will break those patterns. Truly believing that we can go head to head with the strategies that the enemy is deploying in our everyday life. And I guess I'm here to ask you this morning, Life Family, are you ready to? Are you ready to take back ground? Are you ready to deploy our students and deploy yourself out there? If you would like weekly content that builds your faith and helps you walk out all that God has for your life, subscribe and be a part of Life Family. Well, hey, let me uh, read you something out of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. It says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. I was traveling last weekend. I was going to one of my best friend's wedding. Um, he got married in Bend, Oregon. Anybody ever been to Bend, Oregon? Anybody from Bend, Oregon? You? Nice. Give it up for that guy. Uh, we love Bend, Oregon. Um, really, really, really beautiful spot, honestly. Um, and I guess there's like forest fires there all the time. We were actually driving to our um, the wedding venue, the rehearsal dinner um, spot, and this ginormous forest fire broke out, and we were like in the middle of it, and we all got notifications on our phone, like leave now, right now, and we saw a line of cars evacuating, and we were going the exact opposite way because we had to get to the venue. We were good, and they actually got it contained pretty quickly, but don't do that in the case of a fire. Um, but I was traveling back from Bend, Oregon, and I was on a United Airlines flight, and they had little TVs in front of us, um, and they were actually all equipped with DirecTV. So if you have DirecTV in here, you know that there was nothing to watch. And I actually decided to watch something called um, Candies That Changed America Forever. Um, if you know me, you know that I love some candy. I've got about 32 fillings to prove it. Um, so I decided I'm gonna watch this, um, and I start watching. And I learned that in 1982, not a candy, but a toy was developed in America that would kind of change the toy game forever. That was called the Cabbage Patch Kid. Who remembers Cabbage Patch Kids? Who has Cabbage Patch Kids in here? All right, so if you have one of the originals, they're actually worth quite a bit of money. So you might want to go up on eBay and check those out. Um, now, in 1985, kind of in direct rebellion against the Cabbage Patch Kid and its pure, innocent family nature, there was something that was developed in America, and you guys will probably know what these are too. This was the Garbage Pail Kid. Yeah, that was the most appropriate one I could find. Um, if you know what I'm talking about, these things are pretty obscene, okay? Um, my grandparents, they hate these things. My uncle collects them. Uh, what does this have to do with candy at all? Well, capitalizing on the popularity of both of these things, there was a candy developed, and that was the Sour Patch Kid. Come on, who loves some sour candy in here this morning? Love it. Why do I say all of this? Not just to give you a history lesson on toys and candy, but we got these two products because something was developed and deployed in exact rebellion towards another product. They thought, we don't love the pure, innocent nature of Cabbage Patch Kids, so we're actually going to go completely against that and opposite of that and deploy that into the world and see how they like. And I don't know if you feel this life, family, like I feel this as a youth pastor. I don't know if the parents in here sense this, the grandparents, the adults in here sense this, but there is a strategy being developed and deployed by the enemy, and he's going for just about every sector of life that we have to offer here in America and here in the world. That there is a strategy being developed and deployed in our politics and governments that goes against the kingdom of God. There is a strategy that's being developed and deployed in our households that goes against the kingdom of God. There is a strategy being developed and deployed, being put into every classroom right now that goes against everything that God wants for this next generation coming up. And I just think 
that this is the school year, this is the time where we actually rise up again and we say no longer are we gonna allow the next generation to fall into those patterns and get um, abused by that strategy that the enemy is deploying on this next generation and in our families. But it's time for the church to stand up and say, no longer, we're gonna take back ground that maybe we have lost the last couple of years. And we have a student ministry that is excited and expectant for what God can do again in their classrooms and their families. And they are not accepting of the patterns that the enemy is placing in their everyday life. So we are going into this next school year truly believing God will break those patterns. Truly believing that we can go head to head with the strategies that the enemy is deploying in our everyday life. And I guess I'm here to ask you this morning, Life Family, are you ready to? Are you ready to take back ground? Are you ready to deploy our students and deploy yourself out there? And we simply do that by doing what we know to be true, what the Bible says for us to do, and that is lead and set the example in the many things that we have lost the standard to here in this world. And our students are ready to set the example. But I guess my challenge for you this morning, Life Family, would be, will you be a church that shows them the example to live by too? That in order for our next generations to set the example, they must first see the example. In order for them to set it, they first have to see it. Because the example that they're seeing out there could not be further from what God has for their life. Instead of godly speech, they hear some of the most inappropriate jokes, music, and overall talk you will ever hear. And I kind of want to park on this for a second. Because although I see um, inappropriate speech and although I see inappropriate music and inappropriate content coming at our students and this next generation like I've never seen before, what I think I see the biggest problem being is a generation that is rising up and not learning to filter the things that are coming for their brain that they're being exposed to content and they're not even thinking, what am I allowing into the, de the depths of my soul? So if I had a challenge and an encouragement for parents and grandparents, teach your students and your kids not to just simply accept the content that is being given to them, but to filter it with, what am I actually listening to? What am I actually hearing? What am I actually watching? That yes, we can point to explicit music, but we must first equip this generation to be better at filtering the stuff that comes into their brain, which makes its way into their heart and then their soul. Instead of godly conduct, they're seeing, yeah, you can clap for that, great. One person claps, everybody's gotta clap. Instead of seeing godly conduct, we're seeing a wave of people devaluing their bodies like never before. Instead of seeing love, they're being shown in every media outlet possible just how much hate and division is in this world and instead of seeing faith they're seeing people abandon the christian faith in america at really a staggering rate and instead of seeing purity they're seeing a generation that has abandoned holiness altogether man i'm ready for that not to be true of this generation i'm ready for our students to set a brand new example for believers and unbelievers to show their schools and their families around them what it means to live a godly life. They're ready to set that example. My question for you, life family, is are you ready to show them the example that they're supposed to live by? I want to welcome our first guest student preacher. Um, she is amazing. You're going to love this message. Would you please give it up for Mariana Atanes? Thank you, thank you. Hello, my name is Mariana. I am a rising senior for Lake Travis High School, and today my topic will be speech. Just like how Romans said, 1 Timothy 4.12 says, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech. What this verse is saying is that we as Christians should set an example for others through what we say or in our speech. But how can we do this? Well, Proverbs 18.21 says the tongue has the power of life and death, which means that what we say or our tongue can bring the greatest help or the greatest harm into other people's lives. But why does this all matter? Well, porque tus palabras afectan a otros, or maybe you want to hear it in Korean, 
당신이 말이 다른 사람에게 미치는 영향, or maybe even in Portuguese, porque essas palavras afetam os outros. But what I'm trying to say in English is that your words affect others. I mean, isn't it so cool that we can talk to so many people in so many different languages? And sure, how we got the languages isn't as cool. If you don't know what I'm talking about, um, go read about this tower in the Bible. But <laughs> the languages themselves and that the connection that they bring is beautiful. Languages can unite us and yet they can separate us. So why do we often choose to use language, a beautiful thing, for harm? Proverbs 12:18 says the words of the reckless pierce like swords, which means that harsh words are like swords in God's eyes. The sixth commandment says do not murder, which is often interpreted as death caused by physical harm. But what if I told you that this commandment could also mean death caused by our words? What I'm trying to say is that abusive speech that diminishes another person is a violation of the sixth commandment. But it doesn't end there. Proverbs 12, 18 says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the words of the wise brings healing. Life is in the power of the tongue, not just death. But let's go back to Timothy. To give you some context, 1 Timothy 4, 12, Paul is trying to tell Timothy that his words have the power to make or break his ministry, which is why he should set an example for the believers through his speech. His powers have the power, his words have the power to help or harm other people. And what every single word that comes out of our mouths shows or starts from what's inside, which is why your heart posture matters. Luke 6.45 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, which says that the mouth or what we say reveals what is in your heart. James in James 3.11 asks, can both fresh water and salty water come from the same spring? Obviously not. Salty water comes from a salty spring, just like how salty words come from a salty heart. What Paul is trying to get at is that some ways of speaking are completely inappropriate for Christians and should be avoided at all costs. And these ways of speech are associated with the old ways of living, just, how, just like anger, bitterness, slander, abusive speech, and filthy talk. Timothy's challenge was to end all of old ways of speaking and to bring to life all new ways of speaking. He was to make sure that every single word that came out of his mouth was to be good, true, and exemplary. His ministry and even his usefulness to God depended on it. What I'm trying to say is that Timothy's challenge is your challenge. Because today's world gives you so many more opportunities than ever to communicate with people. And every word that you say displays your heart posture. So I want you to find ways to keep yourself accountable, whether that means you get an accountability buddy or you write down your progress on a journal. But what really matters is that you check what is in your heart and you make sure that it is what God wants for you. I want you to make the choice of keeping yourself accountable in your speech and to be an example for the believers and non-believers. But I have one question for you today. What kind of example are you setting for others to imitate? Thank you. Wow. Man, that was great. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rex. Uh, I'm a senior going into Dripping Springs High School. If you want to know a little bit more about me, uh, that's too bad because I only have five minutes. So <laughs> I'm going to be preaching about setting the standard in love, setting the standard in love. And I think it's important when setting the standard in anything, we first have to know the standard. And I think in order to know the standard, we need to look not to the world, not to man, but look to God. So we have to ask ourselves, what is God's standard for love? What does God say about the importance of love? How often should we be loving? And I think when you look in the Bible, you find out pretty fast that love is non-negotiable. God says love is non-negotiable negotiable. There's nothing that can overpower love. There's nothing that can substitute for love. There's nothing that can replace love. It's simply a necessity. It's non-negotiable. 
Now, when I was little, uh, I'd like to consider myself a pretty good, a pretty good toddler. My behavior was good. You know, my, my grades were good, my second grade grades. But my parents had one non-negotiable for me. See, I could be doing the best, the, being the best second grader, but as soon as I was rude to my little sister, that's where they drew the line. That's when I had to go to time out. It was a non-negotiable, no matter how great I was doing. And God is saying that our love is like that. Our love is non-negotiable in that sense. He says through Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, it's an amazing chapter. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now you find out pretty fast when you read this passage that what we do as Christians means nothing if we do not have love. Our worship becomes a resounding gong. The faith we have, even if it's moving mountains without love, it's nothing. The work we do gains nothing without love. So let that put into perspective the importance of love, how non-negotiable love is, how persistent we should be in our love. So now that we know the importance of love, let's look at what God says love is. God says love is patient, love is kind. Come on, how many of us know this passage? It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So I don't want us to skim over this like we so often do and make it a generalization of what we think love is because I think that causes us to have a worldly perception of what love is. I think we tend to consider ourselves loving people, but we forget that the Bible is saying that love is more of an action than it is an emotion, than it is a feeling. The Bible is saying that we have to ask ourselves, you know, are we patient? Are we kind? Are we envious? So I just, I just think we need to be consciously and actively choosing love in every aspect of our life and understand that it's more of a choice rather than it is just a feeling that we have. So in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul continues to talk about choosing love. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. So Paul is saying that when you choose love, you choose to stop acting like a child. Now, if we know anything about children, I mean, I have, I have five younger siblings, and they can tend to be pretty selfish sometimes. Um, I mean, whenever my little brother is waking up in the middle of the night, waking up my parents, that's a little bit selfish. That's a little bit, you know, narcissistic. When my, when my little sister, you know, isn't giving me one of her Oreos or something, that's a little bit selfish. So Paul is saying that actively choosing love is the most selfless thing that we can do. And it's one of the number one indicators of a mature Christian. So I think I'm gonna be part of the generation that is known for choosing to love others. And my question is, will you join me? Thank you. Well, good morning, Life family. Uh, My name is Noah. I'm a rising senior at Lake Travis, and I've been asked to talk about purity. And I want to start by reading a few verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It reads, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. He says, For this is the will of God. How many wonder what the will of God is for your life? I think... Many of us wonder if it's the will of God for us to go to this college or to date this person or to pursue this career. And those are all valid questions, but I think when it comes to the will of God, they're all secondary. God's number one priority for our life is sanctification. Everyone say sanctification. Sanctification is a big church word, but it just means the process of a Christian becoming more like Jesus. 
throughout our Christian walk, God will see to it that we're set apart from the world, that we will increasingly look less and less like the culture around us and more and more like the God who lives inside of us. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So the very first command that God gives regarding sanctification, regarding becoming like Jesus, is that we stay away from sexual immorality. Why? Why is that the first thing? Because it's one of the main ways young Christians especially distinguish themselves from the world. In an age where young people are encouraged to hook up and really treat their bodies as nothing more than objects for pleasure, Scripture says, no, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And not only does remaining pure honor our body, but it also honors our future spouse. We're not just remaining pure for our own sake, but for the sake of our future husband or wife. God's plan for marriage is beautiful, and he wants us to honor and protect it. And I think, kind of just speaking generally here, this generation might be the most perverse generation in terms of the content we consume. We've got a world of lust at our fingertips. We're facing a kind of temptation that no other generation has faced. But here's the thing. I believe we serve a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And although the opportunity for sexual immorality is greater than it's ever been, the same God is declaring the same things, and he's still saying to our generation, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're my special possession. I have saved you to set you apart. And the same God can give us victory today. One of the methods God uses to give us victory is his word. Psalm 119.9 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. When I first got saved, I was kind of going through the Christian YouTube world as one does, and I came across this phrase, and it's kind of stuck with me ever since. It's this, sin will keep you from this book, and this book will keep you from sin. It's difficult to read this book every day and to watch stuff that we shouldn't be watching. It's difficult to read this book every day and cross boundaries in a relationship. God's word protects us from straying from the path of purity. If you're a Christian in this room, the Bible actually says that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. And if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you would know that temples were intended to be holy ground and nothing unclean was allowed inside. And I think in a similar way, God is saying to us, you are holy ground. Nothing unclean belongs in you. It's not who you are. And to ensure that nothing unclean is allowed inside of you, I put my spirit within you to convict you. I've heard this idea expressed like this before. Conviction is the Holy Spirit's notice of eviction. I'll say that one more time. Conviction is the Holy Spirit's notice of eviction. God is saying, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. I've saved you to set you apart. You are holy ground. And that sin or addiction, it's got an eviction date. So we're going to be the generation that says, no, I'm not going to watch that anymore. I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm not going to drink that anymore. I'm going to set godly boundaries in my relationships because God has placed a call on my life. And within every call, there is conviction. And Maybe you're here and you feel like you haven't been pure. Maybe you haven't waited till marriage. Maybe you've watched something or maybe you've done something that you regret. If that's you, I want to tell you about a man named Jesus. This man went to a wooden cross, and on that cross, he took the impurity of the world on his shoulders. All of those times that we failed to be pure, Jesus is saying, I paid for that. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the same blood that washed away sin back then can wash away our sin today And that very blood will transform our lives forever. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. And we hope and pray that this message touched your heart. And we want to hear from you. We want to get to know you. There are several links below this video that you can connect and let us know what's going on in your life. So we would love to invite you to do that. But most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, that is amazing and we want to celebrate you. I invite you to text Next Steps to 22999. We'll respond with a text and give you some resources and next steps for your faith journey. So we just celebrate you and want to uh, invite you to do that. Thank you so much for making this decision to follow Jesus, it's amazing. So thank you again for being a part of our service today. We will see you next time. If you don't have a home church, we would love to invite you to be part of Life Family. Remember, you belong here. Join us again next Sunday or any time throughout the week. Hit that bell so you never miss when we post a new video. Hope to see you again soon.